Okay, hi there. Welcome to a, a Year 13 microeconomics video looking at aspects of price and non-price competition within an oligopoly. Uh, we were focusing on this as part of our revision today and thought I'd share this video uh, with you. So what is an oligopoly? Well, it's a market structure known as an imperfectly competitive market with a high level of market concentration often described as competition among the few. In other words, there will be a few dominant firms. Uh, and typically, it's a market structure that we actually define probably more accurately by the actual conduct or the day-to-day -day decisions of firms within a defined market. So here's a good example of a market where there are thousands of firms, of course, local coffee shops and garden centres coffee shops and, and depart department coffee shops and things. But... The coffee market is essentially an oligopoly in the UK. It's dominated by some of the big players. I've highlighted them in brown. Starbucks, Greggs, uh, incredibly successful Greggs, and Costa Coffee, which of course was bought by Coca-Cola not long ago. Uh, Pret bought Eat a couple of years back. Subway's in there, Cafe Nero. So you have a, you have a market where um, in, on the surface there's lots of competition, but essentially uh, an oligopoly. Here's another good example, the snack food market. Depends how you define snack foods, but if we talk about biscuits and crisps and other things, Walker's in, is in fact far and away the biggest crisp manufacturer in the UK. Uh, McVitie's and Jaffa Cakes and uh, Kettle Chips and others. So snack foods and another good example of oligopoly I came across just a few days ago is the car insurance market. Uh, dominated by, well, six firms essentially, but the top five I put in there in, in green. LV, Aviva, Direct Line, AXA and the Admiral Group. Uh, a rule of thumb, of course, for oligopoly is that the top five firms together have a market share in excess of 60%, which is the case, I think, if you do the maths. <laughs> I hope so on that one, that this is an oligopoly. Okay, there's competition between firms, but this is a market dominated by some, some, pretty, big, some pretty big car insurance providers. Now, the key characteristics of an oligopoly are essentially as follows. The first is, I think, by far the most important, and that is the decision making by firms, be it price or advertising or output or some other metric. Essentially, price, obviously, the key one. Decision making is interdependent, interdependent. You have to think about the likely reaction of your rivals to a decision that you make. One, one characteristic of oligopoly uh, is that oftentimes we have periods of relative price stability. Things don't really change. Even when costs change, prices may stay, in, stay relatively stable. Uh, and that's when firms in the market have probably settled on what they perceive to be a satisfactory profit uh, equilibrium, a satisfactory market share, not much happening. In a, in a world where price is fairly stable, most firms in an oligopoly, they really go gangbusters on non-price competition. So branding and advertising and marketing and product differentiation, quality of sales and things, customer service. Non-price competition is a really key feature of oligopoly. Of course, there will be occasions when conditions are suited to and firms decide it's in their interest perhaps to collude to form some sort of cartel, either informally or explicitly, to fix prices and market share. Now, in most cases, of course, collusion is illegal. It's in form of anti-competitive behaviour, but it's not something that we do see examples of uh, in oligopoly, particularly if you've been up to speed with competition policy in the UK. And whilst we may have periods of relative price stability or rigidity, we also see in oligopoly periodic, often fairly short-lived, but intense price wars between competing firms. Now, we'll come back to that in a second. Uh, I, I mentioned strategic interdependence. I just wanted to make sure that you had a great definition of that. And this means that one firm's output and price decisions uh, are influenced. They're influenced by the likely behaviour of competitors, uh, rivals, particularly those in the market, conceivably in a contestable market, those who might who might come in. This is really important, interdependent decision making. You can't choose price and output and marketing and investment in isolation. You have to be thinking about the likely reactions of your rivals. And this, of course, means that in, in an oligopoly, there is a lot of uncertainty in the market. You can build that into your evaluation. 
So what are the main aspects of non-collusive competition in an oligopoly? This is a, a, a part of oligopoly where we, we, we kind of assume away collusion for the moment. Well, all behaviour by businesses in an oligopoly is strategic. And fundamentally, the choices that firms make, particularly on price, will depend on what their objectives are. And of course, those objectives can and do vary. It may be the case that firms uh, are profit-seeking rather than profit-maximising, by which I mean they're looking to achieve an outcome where they maintain a satisfactory profit, minimum profit, obviously normal profit, perhaps a little bit above, uh, satisfactory and sufficient, but not necessarily a maximum profit. In an oligopoly, oftentimes maintaining, building and then protecting your market share from established competitors is a key objective. It may be the firm wants to go for growth, fast growth, build a user base of customers, achieve some scale economies, again, to reinforce their market position. And a key aspect, again, is that you have to react to the, decision, to the decisions of rival firms and new entrants. So one of the features of oligopoly we often do see is, is periodic, often quite temporary, short-lived, um, but certainly intense price wars that break out. So what can cause a price war to break out in an oligopoly? Well, firstly, price wars often are the result of a disequilibrium, a shock. Uh, for example, an existing cartel may come to an end and there's a lot of uh, noise, a lot of uncertainty and price wars can, can take off pretty quickly. A price war could be triggered by the fact that some, the perception that some firms are pricing too high, making high supernormal profits, and there's a chance to skim away some of those profits from those suppliers by cutting prices. It could be the case that the firm is desperate for market share. They're willing to uh, sacrifice some profits to win market share off a rival. Don't forget, market share is a zero-sum game. If my market share goes up 10%, somewhere else in the market, somebody else's market share must have fallen by 10%. Price wars can break out when new firms, challenger brands, enter the market. Um, perhaps uh, an existing firm may engage in limit pricing to try and inflict some commercial damage. Managers running oligopolies may decide to go for price cuts because in theory that could increase their revenue and then they can get higher bonuses. For example, perhaps their pay is linked to sales revenue rather than profit. And they might, again, they might be willing to sacrifice market share uh, at the expense um, to gain market share at the expense of operating profits. Another reason why uh, firms may engage in a price war is because external factors um, come into play. In a recession, for example, there's a lot of pressure on firms to cut costs and cut prices in order to generate cash to survive in a recession. And as we look into 2021, some people are predicting there's going to be a price war in the aviation sector, as the, hopefully as the international travel sector starts to open up. And uh, the supermarket sector in the UK is the gift that keeps on giving for economic students. Sainsbury's apparently, according to this news report, takes on Aldi, the German deep discounter, in a supermarket price war. Classic example of an oligopoly where firms are battling to, uh, to build and then protect their market share. Now, price wars... In oligopoly are clearly of great interest to economists. There are winners and there are losers. Uh, in a price war, for example, your regular customers, people who buy something pretty regularly, almost by default, in a price war, they're better off because their real incomes have gone down. Falling prices means they can afford to buy more. Managers might benefit if, it's a big if, if higher sales increase their, their bonus incomes from revenues. Firms also, of course, with a price war, firms can use up their spare capacity. You see, if demand is low, a price war means you're selling more volume. That means you're using up your spare capacity. Quite a few of your costs will be fixed. So if you're selling more units, your fixed costs per unit produced will come down. If you think about a business like Walker's Crisps, they have an advertising budget of, let's say, £10 million a year. I'm making this number up. Well, if they sell 100 million bags of crisps, the advertising cost is 10p per packet. If they can double that, use up all their capacity, and sell 200 million packs of crisps, probably even more than that, the, co the marketing cost per packet of crisps comes down. What about the losers? Well, the shareholders may lose in the short term, because obviously if you're cutting prices, then the operating margins 
the gap between price and cost will go down. And that could bring down the dividend payments to shareholders and could also, in theory, of course, uh, cause a, a fall in the share price if it's a listed company. And one of my students made a really great point, which is, well, what about, what about monopsony power? If you have an oligopolist with lots of market power driving their prices down, the final price to the consumer, what about the, the suppliers? So, for example, if you've cut the price of I don't know, potatoes, for the sake of argument, could it be that the supermarkets then say to the, to the growers, well, we can't pay you as much for your potatoes because we're having a price war in potatoes or whatever it is, milk, and uh, therefore we have to squeeze the price that we're, we're going to pay you. It's by no means certain, by the way, that price wars lead to improved economic efficiency and welfare. The winners and losers. And there's quite a strong argument for saying that the price war may lead to short-term increases in sales and revenues, fine, but might, might not actually be in the long-term commercial interests of a business. I'll say a bit more about that in a second. Now, one of the aspects of oligopoly that you, you need to use, and the, and the A-star and A-students, A-grade students definitely do this, is they apply game theory to price wars and price collusions, uh, price collusion within an oligopoly. So here's a simple two-firm, two-price model uh, based around something called the prisoner's dilemma. It's a simple game theory situation where both firms, A and B, have to decide whether to set high prices or low prices. Uh, the table shows the profit payoffs. It's a matrix, and it's the expected profit from doing it. By the way, firm A is always the left-hand side of the two numbers in each box in the table, and firm B is always the right-hand figure. So, for example... If they both set high prices, they'll both make $3 billion of profit. But if they both set low prices, well, they're going to make some profit, a $1 billion each, um, but, but that's obviously less. $2 billion in total is less than $6 billion. If one sets a high price, if firm A sets a high price and firm B sets a low price, well, firm A will only break even, zero profit, uh, but firm, firm A will only break even, zero profit, but firm B will make five, five billion. So that's quite an important idea. And it's symmetrical. So it's the same if firm B charges a low price and firm A charges a high price, then uh, firm A uh, uh, makes the money. Now, in this game, the Nash equilibrium is that both firms will charge low prices. Regardless, because of the way that the numbers work out, regardless of what the other firm decides to do, the best response is to charge a lower price. And if it's true for firm A, it's also going to be true for firm B. So therefore, in this simple game theory situation, uh, that both firms may settle at this low price and each make a billion dollars. However, if these firms were to get together, decide not to compete on price, indeed to collude by setting both of them a high price, then both of them would earn higher total profits, three billion each. Now that's, by the way, it's called joint profit maximization. And that would be better, you're making both both uh, suppliers are, are made better off by that decision. Although consumers, of course, would be would be worse off. So the game theory can be used here in the sense there's a rational motivation to charge to cut prices. It seems rational to do that, but if if, if the other firms do it. Uh, you end up in a situation where you're making less profit than you could have made uh, beforehand. Clearly, of course, price collusion is illegal. So there are fines and potential prison sentences and things if you're found guilty of price fixing. But this theory says that it, it might be better off to collude and both set a high price. Of course, having agreed to set a high price, top left, high, high, there's then an incentive for each firm to cheat on an agreement and undercut the rival. Another aspect which you may have covered as part of available, it's not on the syllabus of every exam board, is something called the kinked demand curve theory. So let me just say a few things about what that might suggest about price competition in an oligopoly. The kinked demand curve is a, is a pretty old theory. It basically suggests that a business in an oligopoly uh, faces a downward sloping average revenue curve, but the elasticity of that demand curve may change, may depend, depending on the likely reaction of your rivals to a change in one firm's price and output. The working assumption is that a rival firm will not follow a price increase. So if you raise your price, the rivals won't follow a price rise 
and that means the the uh, the acting firm um, will lose market share. Okay, so uh, if you raise your, if I raise my price and others don't follow, I'm going to lose quite a bit of market share. There's going to be a substitution effect. I will sell loss, less, perhaps a lot less. If demand's elastic and I raise my price, revenue goes down. However, if I cut my price, the assumption is that rivals will follow a price fall, particularly because they want to avoid a loss of market share. So if, if your rivals go with you, if you cut your price by 10% and they cut their price by 10%, well, you'll sell a bit more because the market may get bigger. But if demand is then priced inelastic as a result because they've just followed you down, again, a fall in price this time will lead to a fall in total revenue. So here's the basic theory that there's two demand curves, one elastic, one inelastic, and the, and the relative elasticity depends on the reactions of other firms. So I think about, if I think about raising price from P1 to, let's say, P2, the working assumption here is that other firms don't follow you. They keep their prices low. You lose a lot of sales. Sales fall from Q1 to Q2. And you can see here that uh, total revenue has gone down. If you think about... Uh, and, 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 and that's no, no motivation, essentially, to, to increase price. Whereas if you cut the price from P1 to P3, the assumption, the likely assumed reaction is that rivals follow the price reduction. Demand is therefore likely to be relatively price inelastic. So you'll get a few extra sales, Q1 to Q3, but you're charging a lower price. And therefore, your revenue has gone down again. So you end up with a kink in the demand curve. Elastic above P1, inelastic below. If you do the, the marginal revenue calculations, by the way, you don't need to be able to calculate this in the exam. But the marginal revenue curve is always twice as steep as average revenue. So if you have a kink in the average revenue curve, shown in yellow here, the marginal revenue curve, shown in orange, will actually uh, have, a, have, a, have a gap in it. There'll be two marginal revenue curves. And uh, it could well be the case that that is a profit maximizing price and output, um, in which case the firm is unlikely to change that price, even if costs go up. So one of the implications of the kink demand curve is that prices will be sticky, stable, rigid, even when there's a change in the cost of supply. Firms have little or no incentive to, to raise or lower their price, and therefore they focus more on non-price competition. So in an oligopoly, firms have price-setting power, but may be reluctant to use it. Uh, rivals are unlikely to match a price rise, and rivals are likely to follow a price fall. If a firm is settled on one price, there may be a little commercial reason to, to change it even if costs change. And therefore, the kink, the kink demand curve suggests that firms probably won't engage in, in long-term price reductions, and they'll focus instead their energies on non-price competition. So will firms who cut price benefit from doing so in an oligopoly? I mean, you can build a decent analysis to show the consequences, obviously. The, the implications or the effects depend on the reactions of rival firms. Again, I emphasize this point. In an oligopoly, uh, there's a lot of uncertainty. The key determinant is what your rival firms do. Do they follow a price fall? Probably likely. The implication for revenue and sales depends on the coefficient of price elasticity of demand. So if there's a lot of consumer loyalty for, for rival firms, if you cut your price, you probably won't sell much more and your revenues may go down. And certainly price cutting, cutting the price, does imply at least a short-term departure from profit maximization. Uh, but of course, some firms may be willing to do that because they're more interested in market share and revenue rather than pure profit. And indeed, there are, uh, very fine, finally, there are some risks. There are some risks and drawbacks, potential downsides from a prolonged period of price cutting. So firms who, who cut price and cut again to try and increase their market share and sales, there are some, there are some risks. Firstly, other firms follow suit. So your revenues go down. Secondly, you're going to be making a smaller margin. So the gap between price and average cost will be lower, uh, unless you achieve big scale economies, but the gap between price and cost will be lower. And of course, companies need profits to fund investment and to finance research and development and to, to meet the needs of, of shareholders. Indeed, if you cut prices and your, your profits take a hit and your share price goes down, well, that can then make a company more vulnerable to a hostile takeover bid, which could be a risk.
And if firms are making less profit, there might be some pressure on those businesses to, to, to reduce the real wages of people who work for them or again squeeze suppliers. So there might be some downside risks for people who work for the business and who supply to the business. And my last point is a little bit of behavioural economics. And I think it's something I just believe in quite, quite passionately. The danger in an oligopoly with cutting price is that you might get a short term increase in sales, but the danger is you devalue your brand. Essentially, there are some firms in markets that can only genuinely sell, you know, they, they rely very heavily on price discounting and keep discounting every week, every month. So without that, they really struggle. Uh, consumers can come to expect lower prices. And we call that an anchoring effect. That once people become come to expect a low price, it's very hard to raise it again. You can damage your brand value. If you're a pizza chain, for example, they're doing pretty well and you start selling cheap pizzas in supermarkets for a fiver, maybe fewer people come to your restaurant to eat. If, if the only way you can sell packets of crisps and stacks of tubes of crisps is to halve the price on, 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 on discount the whole time, people may associate price with quality. And the danger is that you anchor yourself at a very low price in the market. It's hard to increase price without getting some customer kickback. And you really know better than you were before, better off than you were before, but now people expect to pay less than you did before. Okay, well, if you got to the end, congratulations. I just wanted to somehow capture for you some of the issues we looked at in our lesson. Um, oligopoly is a market where there's a lot of non-price competition. Significant. I mean, the battle is really for market share. Price wars do break out. It's by no means certain that cutting prices is good news for a firm, a firm in an oligopoly. And game theory suggests uh, that is the case. Okay, thank you very much indeed.